This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1. Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1 was released in 2004 by Multiman Publishing and Avalon Hill, and designed by Ken Dunn. This game supports two players, and each scenario takes approximately two hours to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harshrules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit Number 1. In this episode, we're going to learn the sequence of play, beginning with the Rally Phase. In the last episode, we reviewed the scenario sheet for retaking Veerville, this game's tutorial mission. Midway down this sheet is the turn record chart. The American player sets up first, but then the German player moves first. This sets up our overall turn order for the scenario. Therefore, the German player will complete the eight phases of their portion of turn one. During their turn, the German player will assume the role of the attacker and the American player the defender. Then, in the second portion of the first turn, the roles are reversed and another eight phases are played through. We've got a lot of phases to cover, so let's begin by looking at the rally phase. At first glance, it seems like there are a lot of steps. However, the rally phase has four functions, and not all of them are used every turn. In the rally phase, the attacking player places reinforcements off-board on their appropriate board edge. Both sides manage their support weapons, attempt to rally units, and remove any desperation morale markers from the prior turn. With all that said, the majority of these steps are not used in the first turn. Players often place the off-board reinforcements during setup so they can skip this phase entirely. However, for this episode we're going to walk through each of these steps so that we have the proper background for the upcoming phases. The rally phase begins with reinforcements. The attacking player will reference their order of battle panel on the scenario sheet for their reinforcement information. Another key reminder is that the turn space will show a national icon if there are reinforcements to add. To complete this step, the attacking player adds those reinforcements to the appropriate board edge. Remember, those reinforcements will move onto the board during the movement phase. And a final note before we move on. The rulebook references a die rule for provisional SSR, in other words, set up special rules. This rule is for situations like in Scenario 5, Clearing Colville, where the US player rolls to determine the number of reinforcements they receive that turn. When playing later scenarios, be sure to always check the scenario special rules for additional requirements like these. The Rally Phase's next section refers to support weapons. To be clear, the first scenario, Retaking Veerville, does not contain support weapons, so you can skip this section for that play. However, I'm going to cover this section as it will pertain to many other scenarios you will play. This section's fir first step is for support weapon recovery. Unlike the last step, both sides may attempt recovery, However, the attacker makes all their recovery attempts first. Recovery is useful in a situation where a squad or half squad in good order is in a hex with an unpossessed support weapon like a light machine gun, and the player wants their unit to pick it up. For that unit to pick up and carry the support weapon, the player needs to make a recovery attempt die roll, with a result less than 6. If the unit has double timed their movement, as indicated by a counter-exhausted marker, they add a plus one to their die result because the unit is tired. A quick note on counter etiquette for this game. Hexes are small spaces, and when there are multiple counters in a hex, it can be challenging to remember if a unit possesses a support weapon or it's just lying on the ground. Therefore, to keep track of this, if a support weapon is unpossessed, make sure its counter is always at the bottom of a stack. When a support weapon is in the possession of a unit, place its counter above the unit. 
In short, if a support weapon is on the ground, the squad is standing over it, but if it's above his head, he's carrying it. Now, not only can units recover support weapons of their own nationality, they can also capture equipment. The recovery process is the same, however, captured equipment can only be operated with certain penalties. First, a weapon's rate of fire is reduced by 1, and there is an increased chance of malfunction. Subtract 2 from the support weapon's B number or X number. For example, a B12 will now malfunction on a dice result of 10 or more. One final note, as we'll see in a moment, captured support weapons cannot be repaired. The next step in the support weapons section is for repair attempts. Both sides may attempt repairs during this step, but the attacker must conduct theirs first. Support weapons like machine guns may malfunction with certain dice results. Typically, unless stated otherwise, a support weapon is assumed to be a B12, which means a dice result of 12 when firing will result in a malfunction. The B in the code means repairable. X-class weapons, like demolition charges and flamethrowers, cannot be repaired if they malfunction. Instead, they are eliminated from the game. Like stated earlier, captured weapons also cannot be repaired. When a good order unit is carrying a malfunctioning support weapon of their own nationality, not a foreign support weapon, the player may attempt a repair. To make a repair attempt, the player rolls a single six-sided die and compares the result to the repair number in the upper left-hand corner of the support weapon counter's malfunctioning side. If the die result is equal to or less than this number, the support weapon is repaired and flipped over to its good order side. However, if the die result is equal to the X number or elimination number in the counter's lower right-hand corner, the support weapon is now irreparable and is removed from the game. Numbers between this are considered a failure, but a repair attempt can still be made in the next rally phase. The final step in the support weapons section is for transfers. In this step, both sides may transfer support weapons, but the attacker conducts all their transfers first. Good order units stacked in the same hex may freely transfer a support weapon amongst themselves. Be sure to follow the counter etiquette we discussed earlier to properly communicate the transfer. Remember, the unit counter below a support weapons counter possesses it. Next up is what we've all been waiting for, the Rally section. When a unit is broken as a result of combat, this is the step where they can make a Rally attempt to return to their good order side. This section begins with Self Rallies. Like other sections, both sides may conduct Self Rallies, but the attacker completes theirs first. As a reminder, a unit has a Self Rally ability if their morale is boxed. Typically, leaders can self-rally, although there is a special exception we will talk about in a moment for attackers. To conduct a self-rally attempt, the player makes a double die roll and compares the result to their unit's broken morale stat. If the dice result is equal to or less than their morale stat, the unit successfully rallies and the counter is flipped back to its good order side. Anything above the morale though, and the rally is a failure and the unit remains broken. Also be aware that there are a number of die roll modifiers that can impact the dice result. Some die result modifiers can make rallying more difficult because they add to a dice result. These include units tagged with a desperation morale marker and a plus one die result modifier for all self rallies. If a unit is in a hex with woods or buildings, they have some cover which makes rallying easier. In these situations, subtract 1 from the dice result. Also, a quick reminder, leaders may not use their leadership modifier to self-rally. There is also a special exception that allows the attacker to self-rally one multi-man counter. This is regardless of whether that unit has a box morale stat and could self-rally. Be aware they do so with a plus 1 die roll modifier. Once all self-rallies are completed, players may then conduct unit rallies with hexes containing broken units as long as that hex contains a leader in good order. Once again, with the unit rally requirements met, the player is making a double die roll versus the broken unit's morale. 
A dice result equal to or less than this morale will successfully rally the unit and flip it back to its good order side. However, if the player rolls an original die result of double sixes, then the unit suffers a casualty reduction. Squads are reduced to half squads, and half squads are eliminated. Dice results between this, and the unit remains broken, but it can attempt to rally in the next phase. With dice results between this, the unit remains broken, and may try again in the next rally phase. Like before, markers, woods, and building terrain die roll modifiers can affect the final dice result. Additionally, leaders can use their leadership ability to hopefully favorably modify the dice result, although there are some poor leaders with a positive modifier in the starter kit to contend with. A final note, with multiple broken units in a hex and a leader in good order, make separate dice rolls for each broken unit and apply the appropriate modifiers. When a unit fails its morale check and is flipped over to its broken side, it also receives a Desperation Morale Marker, or DM Marker for short. There are other situations where a unit can be tagged with this marker as well. If an enemy unit fires on a broken unit that requires a morale check, the broken unit, unit receives a DM Marker. If an enemy unit moves adjacent to a broken unit, the broken unit receives a DM Marker. Or, later during the route phase, if a broken unit is in normal range of an enemy unit, they also receive a DM marker. All of these situations reflect the unit under desperate situations that make it extremely hard to maintain morale, thus the plus 4 modifier to a rally die result. Well, in this final step of the rally phase, both sides can remove all DM markers from their units, with the exception of those adjacent to an enemy unit. Then, if units can maintain a DM-free status, this will make it easier for them to rally in the next rally phase. On the other hand, their opponent will look for an opportunity to keep the pressure on. An additional note for this phase, a broken unit may opt to keep their DM status unless they're in woods or a building. By maintaining the DM marker, this makes the unit eligible to move during the route phase. And that concludes the rally phase, and this is a good stopping place for this episode. In the next episode of this series, we will look at the prep fire phase. So be sure you're subscribed to the channel, ring the bell icon for notifications, so you'll be notified when that episode becomes available. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.